see it uh, in, my, in my PowerPoint, Kevin. I'm born again. I'm born again. Spirit filled. Spirit filled. Spirit led. Spirit led. Bible grounded. Bible grounded. Grace empowered. Grace empowered. Continuous in prayer. Continuous in prayer. Committed to community. Committed to community. Forgiving. Forgiving. Loving. Loving. Generous. Generous. Enthusiastic in my service. Enthusiastic in my service. Patient in my suffering. Patient in my suffering. And ready to see Jesus. Ready to see Jesus. Father, we just thank you this morning for what you're doing already in this place. We ask God that you would just impart something in us that will give us the ability to walk out our purpose and our mission. God, no longer will we just attend church and see that as the fulfillment of our walk. We will gather together as the church in order to scatter and be the church. And so, Lord, as we take in what we need today, I pray that it is used this week to wage war against the enemy, to save those that are lost, and to serve those that are least. God, we just thank you for your son, who not only came into the world to save us, but to change us. He paid it all. Every debt that we owe, he took it upon himself that we may go free. And so, God, our only way to honor that is to live free, to live a life that reflects him and that shows that he is real. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you this morning. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As you're taking your seat, say, he paid it all. <laughs> so, I had the privilege of finishing out the seven last statements of Christ. And um, it's been a powerful, powerful journey. Um, and what I mean by that is that any time you take the time to focus on studying Jesus, it makes a huge difference in the way you view your Christian walk. Because oftentimes people don't look at Jesus. They read the letters of Paul, which is great, and I, I don't have any problem with that. They'll focus on Moses and, and the prophets, but really, who are all those people focus on. The prophets are looking forward to Jesus, right? And the apostles are looking back at him. He has to be the center of our theology, of our philosophy, of the way that we view life. And the cross is like the center of time. It's like everything split from that point and changed that day. And so as Jesus went through these seven statements and he felt the things that he felt on the cross, we find ourselves identifying with him. That's if that is our real focus. If we're just going through the motions, if we just want to just show up and, and say we checked our box, we went to church. See, as a congregation, there's a responsibility that I have to you to equip you, but there's a responsibility that you have to me to be equipped. You can't just come and listen and go, come and listen and go. No, you've got to come and listen and go do something. And so when I look at Jesus on the cross, I wonder how can we live such boring 
living complacent lives with the price that was paid for this. The Bible says that Jesus hung there in Luke and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's important because we all need to know that Jesus felt forsaken. How many have ever felt forsaken? How many have ever felt abandoned? How many have ever felt kicked to the curb or outcasted or ostracized? Your Lord and Savior felt the same. So much so that he had to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Pilate's a politician. He doesn't know what he's doing. The crowd is just following whatever's popular, whatever's on social media, whatever is, 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 is the big thing, the, the fad, so they don't know what they're doing. The soldiers are just following orders, so they don't know what they're doing. Huh? The thief on the cross is just looking for an escape, so he doesn't know what he's doing. Father, forgive me. Why? Because I can't focus on that because one day I'm going to be in paradise. And when your focus is being in the presence of the Lord, a lot of this other menial stuff doesn't mean anything. Anymore. I don't have time for petty mess. I got to overlook that because I got to focus. Right? I'm going somewhere. So, Son, here's your mother, and mother, here's your son. But those that actually do the will of my father, they are my family. And so then I can be safe to commit my spirit into your hands. But before I go, I thirst. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. Jesus begins the final descent. Anybody ever been on an airplane? And they let you know about 15 to 20 minutes out. Come on, y'all. That we are preparing to make our final descent. Put your seat backs up in their upright position. Come on, y'all. Turn your electronics off because we are preparing to make our final decision. They come by and they begin to clean up the aisles. They take your trash. Get your seat belts on because we're getting ready to come in. And so in verse 28 of John chapter 19, Jesus begins to talk from the cross. It says after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, says, I thirst. This is not a request. This is a statement that signifies the final descent. When he says, I thirst, he's not asking for something to drink. He is signaling the shift change. He's signaling that things are about to happen. I want you to write this in your notes. Jesus doesn't just say or do things, he fulfills things. When Jesus said this, he said, this 
because scripture needed to be fulfilled. You've got to understand that Jesus came on a mission and for a purpose. And so everything that he did was intentional. When Judas betrayed him, he said, go, go do it. Because it's got to happen. When Peter cut the man's ear off, he said, Peter, why are you doing that? That don't, that don't have to happen. Oh, Y'all missed that. Sometimes we're doing stuff that doesn't have to happen. <laughs> and because we do things that don't have to happen, we find Jesus having to clean up after us. So Peter, put your sword away and let me heal this man because that's not part of the plan. But this has to happen. There are too many Christians that are doing and saying things but fulfilling nothing. They'll say, love your neighbor as yourself, but they won't fulfill it. They'll say, forgive, but they won't fulfill it. Children, Honor your father and mother. Don't just say it. Be a fulfillment of it. I started last week. Y'all remember when I talked about living a life of fulfillment? And what I mean by that is that scripture comes to life. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Don't just say it. Fulfill it. Sacrifice. Die, struggle, hurt, deal with the pressures, because that's what I do. Jesus didn't just do and say things. He fulfilled things. Oftentimes, there are things in our life, we know more scripture than we can fulfill. That's just the truth. Everybody, me. I know a whole lot of scripture that I, I just, but is that your intention? Are you intentionally working to fulfill what the word says? On the screen here is just a list of about 11 prophetic words that come from just Psalms 69. Wow. Psalm 69 has 11 prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. I'm just going to focus on verse 69, 21, where Christ would be offered gall mingled with vinegar while dying on the cross. When you look at verse 28, that's exactly what they did. They offered him, he said, I thirst, and they took a sponge, put it on a stick, the stick was hyssop, and they held this vinegar wine, this fermented wine that had been sitting out all day long and gave it to him. Now understand this. Up until this point, and I love this about Jesus, he had refused to drink any wine. But at this particular point, he received it. You know why? Because it wasn't about getting my thirst quenched. It was about fulfilling my mission. Uh, that was so good to me I was running around the house in circles I just... sometimes there are things that you do not because you want to do them not because they are appetizing or they are pleasurable or they are desirable it's because this is what I gotta do to fulfill my mission oh, next thing I want to tell you is that Jesus was physically invested, not just spiritually. There are some of us that can pray and sing and worship and but when it comes down to showing up, I'm tired. I'm hurting. I'm I don't feel well. Jesus didn't have to say I thirst. By saying I thirst he basically added insult to injury. You're already... Now, there's some people in this room that believe that apple cider vinegar is good. It's not. 
That is the worst tasting thing. And I thought about that. This morning when I took my little cap full of apple cider vinegar before I went to go work out, I said, Jesus was on the cross dying of thirst. And that's what they gave him? I said, Lord, forgive me for everything that I've ever done to you. Because if you were willing to drink that for me in that condition, wait a minute, y'all don't understand that condition. Y'all don't understand. Anybody ever had, anybody in this room had major surgery? Or women, women, you've had children. Y'all know you get so dry, they give you them ice chips. Imagine if they gave you vinegar. Oh, God. Imagine if that's what they gave you. Just wave at me if you'd be mad. Angry. You punch somebody. Imagine if that's what they gave you while you were suffering. Jesus said, I thirst. And that initiated them giving. He didn't have to say that. He could have just said, it's finished. Yeah. I, I might have skipped that part. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you the truth. I might, why, why add insult to injury? The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. That he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of, of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. He did this willingly for you and for me. Which brings me to my third point. And I like this one. Come on. Jesus, he completed the entire process. He didn't take any shorts. A lot of people will take a shortcut, but not Jesus. He completed the race and took no shortcuts. A lot of us, when it comes down to doing what God has called us to do, we look for an easy way out. But Jesus made the decision long before he ever got to the cross. This is key, y'all. That if you're really going to do what God has called you to do, that decision has to be made long before the moment where the pressure is at the highest. It has to have been something that you have resolved in your heart that I'm going to do it. And you know where that happened? It happened in the garden. In the garden, Jesus said, if there's any other way, let this bitter cup. That means he saw vinegar being given to him. He saw them feeding him something bitter along with the beating, along with the breaking, along with the battling through, he knew ahead of time that I'm going to go ahead and take it. Let me tell you something. On them days, come on, y'all, when you're hurting and you're struggling, remember, he didn't take a shortcut. On those days where you feel like Life has dealt you a raw deal, and you want to tap out. Remember, he didn't take a shortcut. You know what people always tell me? And the more you dig into Jesus, the more it's a ridiculous statement. People say, well, I'm not Jesus. How many have ever said that? Be honest. Don't, don't play with me. Have you ever bled? Raise your hand. Have you, has your body ever hurt all over? Raise your hand. Have you ever been betrayed? Raise your hand. Have, 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 have you ever been rejected? Raise your hand. Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? Raise your hand. Have you ever? Come on. Ever, ever. Have people that said they were going to be there for you, abandon you? Have you ever? then it sounds like to me that you are just like Jesus. You sound just like him. You don't sound any different. You sound like him. And so let me tell you this. I pulled this up 
as I was studying it, I just liked it so much I had to throw it in here. The elevator to success is out of order. You'll have to take the stairs one step at a time. Turn around and tell your neighbor, the, the elevator's out of order. You're going to have to take the long road. Anybody taking the long road right now in your life? Anybody feel like, man, why can't I just jump on this elevator and head right on up? And you pushing the button and it don't work. And so now you got to go and take the stairs that's way down at the other end. And then you got to climb them. And you don't got to go to the first floor. You don't have to go to the second floor. That's good. You're not going to the third floor. You're not even going to the tenth floor. You got to go to the top. Because you're pressing towards the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, and he is the highest. You're looking for a shortcut. The Apostle Paul said this when he was in the book of Acts. I believe he's in Corinth. He said, I consider my life worthless, a worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying the good news of the grace of God. That's all. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Put it in your notes. This is a person with focus and Jesus was on the cross hanging there and he's not looking for a shortcut. I'm a Rocky fan. You know, by the time I was, I don't know, 12, I had already watched the first three Rockies like 15 times. Because growing up in Philadelphia, you watched Rocky. And I didn't just watch Rocky. While I'm watching it, I'm doing push-ups. I got my shirt off. Rising up. Huh? Huh? And in Rocky Three, after he got beat by Clubber Lane, and he wanted to quit, he went back to the beginning. He went back to the place where he originally trained. Sometimes that's what's missing. When you feel like quitting, you gotta go back to the beginning. You gotta go back to when you first gave your life to Christ. And you gotta figure out what have you lost. Because I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room, at some point, you are so saved that you begin to forget the foundations of your relationship with Christ. And you get caught up in some other stuff. And that other stuff gets you distracted. And you no longer focus on the stuff that God wants you to be focused on. So everything gets harder and harder and harder because you're not focused on the basics. Yep. Paul said that he was afraid that you might be deceived from the simplicity of the gospel. It is not difficult. Only a theologian can mess it up. Y'all get that in the party. Sometimes people are so smart that they mess up the most simple thing. Love God. Love people. And let the Lord take care of the rest. And so Rocky runs into Apollo because Apollo, for some reason, knew that's where I find you. Going back to the beginning. And what happened is he ended up having to recapture the fire that he once had. Anybody ever gone through a phase where you lost the fire? Oh, y'all? Yeah. So all, all uh, 25 that have never lost the fire... I need some help from y'all. <laughs> there are only four people in the room have ever lost their fire for the Lord? Let me ask this question again because maybe you didn't understand. Have you ever lost your fire for the Lord? Raise your hand. Okay. Because I thought I was in heaven. <laughs> and when you have to recapture that fire... You have to end up going back to the basics. It's so true. It's so true. Go back. You're too far ahead of me. It is so true. Number four. Jesus was willing to go through everything that we go through. 
He was willing to go through everything that we go through. Hanging there on the cross saying, I thirst, meant that he was willing to be human enough to relate. This is why I don't understand some leaders in the body of Christ who can't relate to people. How come Jesus can relate to us, but you can't? How come Jesus can understand our brokenness, but you can't? How come Jesus can understand the fact that I'm broken, I'm tired, I'm hurting, but you can't? Jesus made sure that he was going through the same things that we go through. The woman at the well, y'all remember in John chapter 4? Yes. He told her, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. How come the person who has eternal life, who's offering living water, now puts himself in a position where he thirsts? Wow. See, see, Jesus turns everything on its head. Everything that we think is one way, Jesus turns it another way. Instead of using his power to take himself off the cross, he stays on it. We're trying to use his power to keep us from suffering, and he didn't even use his power to keep himself from suffering. That'll hit you uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> You'll be walking down the streets. Oh, my God. You didn't come down? Because I would have called the angels, and they would have came by and pulled the stakes out and just levitated me off the cross in front of everybody. Why didn't you come down? So Jesus, when my back is hurting, I don't need to come down. When my head is hurting, I don't need to come down. When my chest and my shoulder and, and my neck, you're saying I should stay up there? Y'all get that in about two weeks. Jesus was willing to go through everything that we went through. Go to the next, ver next verse. He who says, uh, who, he who abides in him ought to himself also walk as Jesus walked. Some years ago, I almost turned this into a t-shirt. Walk as Jesus walked. That's good. And the reason why is because I felt like people are totally missing this. Yes. How can you... He was willing to step into your shoes. And all he, and now all he's asking is for you to step into his shoes. So he took the suffering. You take the purpose and go do it. He did the dying so you can do the living. He did the teaching so you can do the preaching. Y'all get that. Y'all totally missed that. He taught us what it looked like to serve God to the end on the cross so that you can go and preach that message to every man, yes, woman, yes, boy, yes. and girl from 8 to 80, prime, triple, and crazy. You better go and tell somebody what Jesus did. Y'all looking at me funny. If there's one thing, listen to me. Listen to me. If there's one thing that you know about me. Y'all know I be sharing the gospel. Yeah, you do. All the time. I be ministering to people and you don't even know I'm doing it. You drop me off, I'm like a secret agent. <laughs> you put me in somebody's on somebody's job or in somebody's school, people come out saved, but all them folks got saved. Yeah, you don't send me there. If you don't want nobody to get saved, don't send me. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what is wrong with the rest of the church? It felt like that's all I cared about when I wasn't having to equip others and counsel others. Sometimes I feel like, man, God, I just want to go back to just witnessing the people. I'm tired of equipping people that don't go do nothing. Can, can I be real? Be real. No, y'all don't want me to be real. Be real. Y'all don't want that. Yeah. 
myself, like, man, what, 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 it was just me and you, God. I didn't have to study for no men's group. I didn't have to study for no preaching or no classes. or no, I'm just studying for me and you. Right. Oh, amen. Boy, man, I'm meeting people on street corners. I'm praying for people. I'm, I'm at the 7-Eleven. I'm at the local, man. I, it's just everywhere. In the high school, I got Bible studies and prayer groups on, going. Now. I'm just doing this thing because what well, it's just me and you. But then you take me from that and say, equip others to do what you've done. You ever had to teach somebody to do what you do and they didn't want to learn it? Y'all don't know them. Y'all don't know what that's like. If you know what that's like, just wave at me real quick. Amen. <laughs> and so he who says he abides in him ought to walk as he walked the greatest compliment that I've ever received from anybody was that, man, you really show me what Jesus is like. That compliment, for some reason, always brings me to tears because that's all I've ever wanted. I don't want nobody to know me. I don't want to be popular. I don't want to be on TV. I want to know that when people encounter me, they encounter him. That when people get done being around me, and, and there's people that will say this, they, they get from being around me and they so fired up to go do what God says, and then they get around the rest of the church and they get discouraged. Mm -hmm. I said, what? Yeah. I've been wanting to go beat people up. I'm like, why you, why you discourage him? <laughs> he was getting ready to do some stuff, and you want to talk this, what? I'm telling you, man, some... Sometimes I'm ready to beat somebody up. Because I don't want to beat nobody up for me. But when somebody I, I've encouraged and built up and loved up goes and encounters somebody else that says they're a Christian and they come back discouraged and ready to just give up, I say, what the heck? You talk about turning over some tables. <laughs> Y'all know, y'all know I love God. Because you ain't never, you have never really seen me go off. What's your life? I'm taking doors off hinges. It went right through them. Huh? One apartment we had, every wall had a fist print in it. Come on now. Come on, that's my kind of style. Come on. And so when I'm walking with Christ, he took all that out of me and turned that intense anger into an intense love. Yeah, Come on now. Oh. Yeah. People are like, Pastor, why don't you give up on that person? Because I can. Oh. Even if I wanted to, I don't have it in me no more to give up on people. I'll keep loving them. Right, right, right. Especially when I look at the cross. Yes. When you look at the cross, you have no right to walk around here with attitude. You ought to start slapping your own self upside your nappy head when you start having an attitude. You get an attitude, you ought to with you. Right. what Jesus did. Right. To yourself. Look, look. That right there. He says, uh, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon put put it upon hyssop, which is a stick, and it's a uh, it's a herb kind of thing, but it's a little stick, and they put the sponge on top of it, and they put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, "It is finished." You watch this. Watch how each thing signals the next thing. Watch this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So once he knew everything was accomplished, he said, I thirst. As soon as he says, I thirst, watch this. Now, there were, a, there were a set of vessels full of vinegar, 
and they filled it with a sponge, and they put it, uh, put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, everything is connected. He says, I thirst, they prepare the vinegar. Mm. He tastes the vinegar, he says, it's finished. Mm. Now watch this. It's going to be good. When, okay, never mind. The thing that you have to recognize about Jesus is that when he says, I thirst, he is literally saying that everything that has ever been written about what he, sorry, when he says, I, when it's finished, sorry. Everything that was written about him to this particular point, he's saying is accomplished. Jesus fulfilled all that was spoken about him. There are over 351 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Let me show you this. Go to the next one. Even to accomplish eight, the birthplace, the time of birth, the manner of birth, the betrayal, the manner of death, the people's reaction, the piercing in his side, and the burial, the probability of any one person fulfilling all eight of these prophecies is one and ten to the seventeenth power, which is one in a trillion. Aaliyah said one in a million. Jesus is one in a trillion. Huh? He's one in a trillion. Wow. Is that a trillion? Where my math majors at? Is that a trillion? What is it, Josh? I know Josh. That's a quadrillion. Yeah, that's quad. Yeah, it's all. It's one more than a trillion. Yeah, quadrillion. One hundred trillion. One hundred quadrillion. That messed me up even more. I thought a trillion was one hundred trillion. Good Lord. 100 quadrillion. Y'all messing with me. It's more than anybody. It's more. <laughs> right. Just eight of the prophecies. Just these. So the people that say, well, Christianity was stolen from this and stolen from that. None of those people can fulfill these eight. Right. Wow. There is only one. That part. That's why he's called the Christ, which literally means. And this is what makes Jesus so unique. That when he said it's finished, he said everything that has ever been said about me is fulfilled. I did it. I finished it. There's not never going to be anybody. There was never anybody before me, and there's never anybody. Going to be after me. That's when I have discussions with people and they say, well, you know, how, you know, how you know that Jesus, because there ain't nobody else. And, and once we come to the agreement that he is an actual person yeah. and he lived and we go through the archaeological and the historical evidence and the testimonies of people outside of the Bible that know that he was there and you see the stuff that he has fulfilled, there cannot be any argument. He is unequivocally the one. Wow. Right. Oh. Y'all didn't know y'all were going to get a teaching this morning. Come on, teach. Come on, next one. Let's go. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Jesus settled our debt. We heard the song, he paid it all. Mm -hmm. What this literally means is that everything that you owe, okay, don't say it out loud, but the folks that are brave enough to just go back and think about everything raunchy thing you ever did. Every dirty thing you ever did. Every deceptive thing you ever did. Every terrible thing you've ever done. And think that when Jesus laid there on the cross, he paid he paid it. He took it, care of it. He paid your debt. Because the bill always comes due. The, 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 you cannot get around. The bill always comes due. Let me show you something. Go to the next slide. I want to show you in the Old Testament the things that got death. 
My God. Romans uh, 6.23 in the New King James says, For the wages of sin is what, y'all? Death. What is it? Death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So in the Old Testament, I pulled out about 21 things that you could die for. Y'all ready? Murder, of course. You can die from murder. Uh, uh, contempt, uh, contemptuous act against the judge. So if you talk back to a judge, you know how they hold you in contempt of court? Back then they killed you. Wow. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't play. They didn't play. Causing a miscarriage. Wow. Death. Y'all got quiet. Lying in a capital crime. Mm. Death. Negligence that causes an animal to go and kill somebody. Wow. You know how, how, how often that happens today? Yeah. Y'all yeah. mm -hmm. not with me. Idolatry. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. You paid it all. Yeah. <laughs> Blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Anytime you decided to speak ill of God, Jesus, the Bible, he says back then you would die. Yeah. Wow. Witchcraft and sorcery. That's right. False prophet. A false prophet back then, if you were just wrong, if you were wrong and what you said didn't come to pass, they killed you. Breaking the Sabbath. Okay. Homosexuality. They killed them. Bestiality. They killed them. Adultery. They killed them. Rape. They killed them. Apostasy. If you just stray away. Incest. Cursing your parents. Wow. Ooh. Everybody say, mm. <laughs> Kids' rebellion. They killed you. Kidnapping. Drunkenness. Anybody ever been drunk? Dead. Dead. Touching the temple's holy furnishings. You came in and you touched this, dead. But guess what? He paid it all. I, one person got that. He paid it all. He took away the punishment for sin and death. And this is the one that really got me. This is, this is so good. This is so good. Jesus showed us how to deal with sin once and for all. He let them crucify his flesh. There is only one way to deal with sin, y'all. And it's not trying not to sin. Crucify the flesh. Let me say that again. You can try not to sin all you want. Try not to look at this. Try not to look at that. Try not to say this. Try not to say that. It will not stop you from sinning. Right. You can, you can ch ch check your thoughts. Oh, check. I'm guarding my thoughts. You just go crazy. Huh? Yeah. You you just be nobody will even be able to, be able to talk to you. You'll just be. <laughs> you know how he said, "Crucify the flesh." When you deal with your flesh, sin loses its power. When Jesus killed his flesh, when next time they saw him, he was in a sinless body. Right. So when he dealt with the flesh, he dealt with sin. Sometimes you got to attack things from a different way. Y'all are one of them head on. I'm just going to fight it. But in this case, Jesus said, you know what? Once I die and they bury this body, I'm going to come up new. That's why through all of Paul's writings, he talks about crucifying the flesh. Put that next one up there. We just about done. This, this, this is so good. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and its lust. That's good. Wow. Imagine daily when you go into prayer that every time you read a passage, you are putting stakes in that flesh. Every time. You spend extra time with God. You yes. nail that flesh yes. to the cross. Every time you focus more on your purpose than your pleasure, you are tearing that flesh up. As a matter of fact, you ought to want to give that flesh some of that 
apple cider vinegar so it can go. Mm, all right. You ought to want to torture it to death because it needs to be tortured. You ought to be a... If you really want to win, then you're going to have to finish things the way that Jesus did. And that means, come on, y'all, that I got to crucify my flesh. The things that I want to do, I've got to focus on what God wants to do. And this is important, y'all, because you just try not to do bad things. Just focus on doing the good things that he wants you to do. And you won't have time to do bad things. I say it year after year, over and over again, and nobody believes me. If you would turn off the television and open up your Bible, you wouldn't be struggling to want to look at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. And when you do struggle, keep reading. Come on now. And keep reading till you're not struggling. Keep reading till you don't want to look at it no more. Keep reading till you don't want to go no more. Keep reading till you don't want to cuss them out no more. Keep reading till you don't want to be angry no more. Keep praying until you don't think the way that you thought. And see, what happens is we're constantly trying, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. And so listen, this is the, this is the, the repercussions of that, is that we become so judgmental and critical of other people. Sin managers end up being critical and judgmental of other people because they're like, well, you can't do that. You know why? Because I can't do that. Right. That is true. Yeah. You just shamed him. Y'all don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. This is good stuff. And I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Hey, listen. <laughs> when you focus on loving your neighbor, how you going to cuss him out? Yes. 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 Amen. Yeah. Mr. Tim's with me. I know he knows what I'm talking about. Yes. When you focus on encouraging people, yes. how you going to criticize them? Yes. Yes. When your goal is to lift people's spirit, how are you going to walk around depressing folks and oppressing people? Thank you. They say, man, there are no secrets in life, right? But I'm going to tell you, that's a secret right there. People say, Pastor, how do you stay so loving and humble towards people? It's because I focus on them winning, not me. As soon as I focus on me winning, then I end up talking down to people and hurting people. But when I focus on them winning, and I'm trying to figure out how do I get them to win? How do I get them to get closer to Christ? How do I get them to become everything that they're supposed to be? And that is not just supposed to be my job. That's supposed to be every single one of your jobs. Is You're supposed to be a conduit of encouragement. When people yeah. get around you, their spirit should go up. They should not feel depressed or hurt or despondent or outcasted. Yeah. They should feel welcomed and loved because that's what Jesus died for. He didn't die for division and brokenness and hatred within the body of Christ. They will know us by our love. Y'all don't get it. 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 <laughs> when I look out on the landscape of Christianity, as the movie producer and writer said, people know what Christians are against. But what are Christians for? What are you championing? What is it that you're promoting? What is it that you're building up? What are the causes that you want to get behind? I know what you don't want to get behind. I know what you don't want to see. But what do you want to see? Because if you focus on that, you'll be more effective in this world. You'll be more effective in the community. You'll be more effective on your job and in your school if you focus on what you want to see. What does Jesus want to do here? Yes. Not what I don't like. I wish I could just have a buzzer. But that wouldn't work because then that would be too legal. I wish y'all would get shocked every time you say, I don't like that. Ow! <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you think Jesus was in favor?
favor of the way he was treated. He was hurt. The Bible says that he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. And we counted him. Somebody else will do it. Lord, send somebody to 
to my door. No, you go to your door.
Protect us. 